Okay, so first of all, thank you for returning the question sheets, which I'm marking at the moment. That's quite a big, thick file. So I will finish them uh, by tomorrow, or day after tomorrow, and uh, return them to you, okay? So thank you for doing that. Um, today's lecture is going to be about deformation and texture. And you are probably already familiar with the importance of uh, texture. So for example, when, when I was uh, at school, when you bought a Coke can, it wasn't a single can of Coke. It was actually a sheet which was welded, and then the bottom was welded on top, and the top was welded. Here, this is a single piece of material which has been deep drawn, and the only way of doing this is by controlling the texture so that the strain in the thickness direction is minimized. And of course, you have all the components that you put inside a car which need formability and so forth, and all that is done by controlling the crystallographic texture. Now, in order to introduce texture and the crystallography, uh, we need to think about uh, single crystal deformation, okay? And the classic work on single crystal deformation was done by Schmidt and Boas long time ago, 1950s. And you can actually download his uh, textbook from our website here, okay? So you can download the complete textbook free of charge from our website. It deals with uh, fundamentals of crystallography, uh, elasticity of crystals, production of crystals, orientation, crystal deformation, plasticity, and even for ionic crystals, and how strength is determined by crystallography. It's a beautiful book to read, okay? It was written, I think, back in 1945, some, something like that, but it still is accurate. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a single crystal here, and we are applying a force along this direction, and this is the plane on which a slip occurs. So what is the area of that plane? So if the cross-sectional area of the specimen is uh, A, then what is the area of this plane? Yeah, so A divided by cosine of uh, uh, phi, okay? So if you wanted to work out the stress on that plane, how would you do it? So you've got the area of the plane, which is uh, A divided by cosine of phi. So what is the stress? We've got a force here. Yeah, so first of all, we've got the slip plane area, which is A divided by cos phi. And we resolve the force in the direction of the slip, because slip occurs by a shear, okay? So this is the direction along which slip occurs, so we have to resolve the force along the slip direction, which is F cos lambda. So the stress is F cos lambda divided by A over cos phi. Here you are. F cos lambda divided by A over cos phi. Is that, is that okay with everybody? Okay, so if I rearrange that, then I get the shear stress causing the slip is equal to F cos lambda cos phi divided by A, where cos lambda cos phi is known as the Schmidt factor. The same Schmidt of the book, Schmidt and Boas. Yeah. So slip will occur on that slip system on which the Schmidt factor is the maximum, because there are many, many slip systems, usually, in a crystal, and slip will occur on that system which is most stressed. In other words, for which this factor, the Schmidt factor, is the largest. Now, some of you may have been to Professor Dong Lee's lectures, where he also did something like this, uh, looking at single crystal plasticity and the Schmidt factor and so forth. So slip will occur on the system which has the highest Schmidt factor, cos lambda, cos phi. And I can represent this whole process on a stereogram. So again, this is our single crystal, and this is the slip plane. And in my stereogram, that slip plane will look like that. It's, an, it's a plane with the diameter of the stereographic sphere. And the normal to that plane will point somewhere there, and the slip direction will be somewhere along that plane. So there's 
the normal to the plane and perhaps the slip direction pointing that way. And here is the stereographic representation of this geometry. So we have the force being applied along this direction. The normal to the slip plane is pointing along here. You see this normal is inclined to F. Yeah? And if I draw the trace corresponding to the pole N, then that's the trace, isn't it? Yeah? That's effectively the perimeter of this slip plane. Yeah? So that's the trace. And clearly, the slip direction must lie on that trace. right? So S is located over here, the slip direction. And the angle between F and S, F and S, is lambda. And the angle between F and the normal to the slip plane is phi. And that, of course, is the opposite of that slip direction. Yeah. So this is the stereographic representation of the tensile test here. Okay. Now, there is a very easy way of working out which slip, slip system will be the most highly stressed. And we call this the Deals rule. I'll go into that in a, in a second. But first, can you tell me what the slip system for FCC crystals is? So for, for cubic F crystals, what is the slip system? One, 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 one plane, one, yeah. one, zero direction. Yeah, so the slip system is one on one planes and one zero bar one direction. So this is for cubic F. And for BCC, body centered cubic, cubic I? One, one, zero plane. So one one zero planes and one bar one one directions for cubic I. So if you think about it, if you write all possible combinations of one one ones and one zero ones, you'll have twenty four slip systems in cubic F or in cubic I. Okay, so there are twenty four possible slip systems either in austenite or in ferrite. Now, supposing that I cause slip on my crystal, so this is again our crystal and this is the slip plane, then you will get something which looks like this. Yeah? The, the, it's like a stack of cards being displaced. And the consequence of this is that the direction along which the force is applied is effectively rotated. So F dashed here becomes F plus some scalar times the direction along which the shear happens. Yeah? So the effect of the slip is to rotate the force direction. But supposing that you're doing this in a tensile testing machine, where you know, the grips are not allowed to slide horizontally, then what will happen? Hmm? So the, the crystal itself will rotate right by, by the same angle here. So if I, if I constrain the single crystal so that there's no way it can rotate, uh, sorry, that uh, the grips cannot rotate, uh, cannot shift horizontally, then the crystal slip planes will effectively rotate. And they will rotate in such a way that the force direction moves towards the shear direction. Okay? You can see that the difference between F dash and F is given by some scalar, the amount of shear, times a unit vector along the shear direction. Yeah? And this is a photograph from uh, Schmidt and Boas's book where you can see this zinc crystal, single crystal of zinc, exactly like this picture over here. Okay? So on our stereographic representation, which we constructed earlier, where this is the normal to the slip plane, that's the slip direction, and this was the original orientation of the force axis, F dashed will move towards S, where F, F dashed, and S lie on the same plane. So if I go back to the previous slide, you can see that that's F, that's F dashed, and that vector here is alpha s. So there are, the three vectors are coplanar. So the tendency will be for the force axis to move towards the shear direction. Okay? 
on this great circle, which contains both f, f dashed, and s. So you can work out which direction the force axis is going to move by that simple equation that f dash equals f plus s. You will see later on that the rotation of these crystals, uh, here, here I'm talking about the rotation of the force axis, but it's exactly the same thing to talk instead about the rotation of the crystal. The rotation of the crystal is what gives rise to texture in materials when we deform them. Right, so uh, here are our stereograms, and this stereogram represents uh, body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic. And you said here that the slip system for face-centered cubic consists of one-one-one one, one planes here. So these are the one-one-one one, one FCC planes, and the directions are given by those one-one-zero type directions. And similarly for the BCC crystal, we have. Uh, slip planes corresponding to these 1, 1, 0 type planes, and the slip directions are along 1, 1, 1. This is one stereographic triangle, and at the corner of the triangle you have a 1, 1, 1, here you have 1, 1, 0, and this is 0, 0, 1. So we can think about deformation in terms of just one, one stereographic triangle. I want to show you a simple rule which allows you to calculate very quickly which slip system out of these 24 possibilities will be the most highly stressed if I place my tensile axis here or here or here. Okay? So without doing any geometrical calculations, it's possible to work out which slip system will be the most highly stressed if I put my tensile axis at a particular location. So this is known as a Deal's rule. Imagine that we have our tensile axis over here, okay? And we are dealing with uh, a face-centered cubic crystal. Then you go to the nearest 111, which is the slip plane, okay? The 111. So here's our tensile axis. You go to the nearest 111 and you reflect it from the opposite side, and that gives you the actual slip plane that's operating, okay? And similarly, if you go to the nearest 101 and you reflect it through the opposite side, then that gives you the nearest, uh, that gives you the slip direction. So the combination of slip direction and slip plane is the slip system which is most highly stressed. Yeah. So this is called Deal's rule. So what I do is I go towards the nearest 101, reflect it to the opposite direction, uh, opposite side of the triangle, and that gives me the slip plane. Take that, 101, reflect it through the opposite side, and that gives me the slip direction. So notice that this and this are at 90 degrees to each other. Because if you take the dot product, it's zero. Yeah? Everyone happy with Deal's rule? Here's a, another example where I've got my tensile axis now located on a 1, 2, 3 pole there. I go to the nearest 111, reflect it through the opposite side, that gives me the slip plane. Go to the nearest 011, reflect it through the opposite direction, that gives me the slip direction. And these two are at 90 degrees to each other as they should be. Yeah, because the slip direction lies in the slip plane. So as I deform my crystal, the, this uh, um, tensile axis will move towards the slip direction, right? Do you remember F dash equals F plus alpha S? So the tensile axis will rotate towards the slip direction and eventually it hits this point. So what do you think would happen if the tensile axis lies on an edge which is common to two stereographic triangles? So when, when it's located over here, we only have one slip system operating, right? What happens when you hit a uh, an edge so that it actually lies in both stereographic triangles? Yeah, so the way to imagine it is supposing that it lies over here, just displace it slightly, slightly in here. Then I go to this, reflect it to the opposite side, that's my slip plane, okay? 
and I go to this and reflect it through the opposite direction, that's my slip direction. So if it's at the edge, both of those slip systems will operate simultaneously because both of them are similarly stressed, right? So the consequence of that is that you get interference between slip on different planes and you get work hardening, right? So the initially when only one slip system is operating, you say that's easy glide because you, you're not getting interactions between dislocations. They're all slipping on one plane. As soon as you start to have slip on two systems, you get work hardening because dislocations cut each other and multiply and so forth. So you go into a stage of work hardening. What happens when my slip system goes to one of these points? Because once it gets over here, the mean, uh, mean slip direction will be the sum of this and this. In other words, the force axis will start to move along here. And eventually, it will reach here. Then it becomes really complicated because you have all these, all these stereographic triangles to cope with. Yeah? So you'll have many, many slip systems operating. So when it gets to this edge, you'll start to get two slip systems operating. And the slip directions are this and this. And the mean of these two directions will be, li will be along 1, 1, 2. So eventually, your tensile axis will get to this point 1, 1, 2. OK? Is everybody happy with that? Initially, there's only one slip system operating. Then you start to get multiple slip systems operating and enormous work hardening in your crystal. OK? Now, initially, also, when you have just one slip system operating, you will also get uh, hardening, but it's known as geometrical hardening. Because as the force axis moves towards the slip plane, yeah, you effectively uh, are reducing the stress. And therefore, you have to apply more and more stress to cause deformation. And that's just geometrical hardening. But this, when you get multiple slip systems operating, is because the defect density is increasing by intersections happening on different planes. OK? OK, um, so this, this is just to show you that if we constrain the force axis to lie along the vertical, then instead of the force axis rotating, your crystal starts to rotate, OK? Relative to the force axis. So uh, in real life, uh, more, we are mostly dealing with polycrystalline materials. So here, for example, is a, is a rolling mill for stainless steels, where you make extremely thin sheet of stainless steel for razor blades. Okay? Uh, this is a picture I took in Sweden at Sandvik, who manufacture a lot of stainless steel for razor blades. And in order to make it extremely thin, you've got to have all these backing rolls. Yeah, the actual Deformation happens in a very narrow region here, but to keep those very thin rolls straight, you've got to have a whole set of backing rolls on there. Okay? So there's quite a lot of severe deformation there, and there will be a tendency then for the crystals inside our material to align themselves according to the rotations that we described earlier. Okay? So even if you started off with a rain, random arrangement of crystals, they will tend to rotate into similar orientations relative to your reference axes. So in this case, the reference axes are the rolling direction, okay? the normal direction, that means the thickness direction of a foil, and the transverse direction. So this is, this is just the conventional axis used for samples during rolling. Rolling direction, transverse direction, and the <coughs> normal direction. Normal direction is the thickness direction of the plate. Yeah? So if I want to represent the orientations of these crystals on a, on a stereogram, I could use these axes to plot the orientations of the crystals. Now, I've used the word texture already, but I haven't uh, defined it. So texture simply means that we have a non-random distribution of orientations of crystals relative to some 
external set of axes. Okay, so the external set of axes is the rolling direction, the thickness direction, and the normal direction. If the crystals are not distributed at random relative to those axes, we say we have texture. Okay. Right, now this represents a random distribution. Here is a stereogram. These are my axes, transverse direction, rolling direction, and the normal direction. And this represents a random distribution of crystals. Does it look random to you? Why do you say that? I, I can see more poles here than here. Yeah, we, on the stereogram, we, we have a concentration of angles towards the center. So even though this doesn't quite look random to someone who hasn't been to the course, it is random because the angles are compressed in the middle. Okay? Uh, this is extremely rare, all right? So, so supposing you make something by powder metallurgy without applying any stresses, you might get a random distribution. This is actually generated by calculation. Right? But you very, very rarely find a random distribution of crystals because whatever kind of processing you do, you will introduce some preferred orientations. So for example, recrystallization will depend on the original grain structure and therefore you will get texture from recrystallization. Deformation will cause texture. Um, magnetic fields will cause texture. And really, it's quite difficult to find randomly oriented polycrystals. Okay? Comparing with this, this is a strongly textured material where I'm plotting the 100 poles of each one of these crystals on here. So there are three of these poles plotted on this stereogram for each crystal. Okay? So this is called a pole figure. And you can see that there is a, a clustering of the 100 poles along the rolling direction, transverse direction, and the normal direction. So this is a representation of strong texture. Okay. Now, you can plot this stereogram differently. You can plot contours of uh, the density of poles. So here, there would be many contours focused together, very few in between. And that's, a, that's just another way of representing texture. Um, instead of plotting just the points, you plot contours of the density of poles at that particular location. Okay. So this is called a pole figure. And this is uh, an inverse pole figure. So here we are plotting the crystallographic axes relative to the external axes, which are the axes of the plate that we are rolling. Okay? Here we are plotting the transverse direction, the rolling direction, and the normal direction relative to the uh, 110, 111, and 001 axes of the crystal. So we take uh, take crystallographic axes and we plot for each crystal where the rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction lies. Okay? So that's your inverse pole figure. And in this case, we are plotting contours instead of lots of dots. Because you can see here, I can't really tell how many dots there are. Yeah? So contours is a better way of doing it. Everyone happy with a pole figure and inverse pole figure? So we're just swapping the axes around. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, all this information you have to get by diffraction, right? And one common way nowadays uh, is by doing uh, things like EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction. Okay, and that relies on your electron beam. Uh, being slightly rocked, and whenever you satisfy the Bragg angle, you get very little intensity because the, the beam is reflected into your sample. Okay, so that gives rise to uh, channeling patterns, which looks like this, and then you have a computer program of some sort which interprets these patterns to give you the crystallographic orientation of that particular grain. And you do that for hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of grains, and you generate your pole figures from that. Or you, you um, have a nice colored image like this, where the colors represent 
orientations on your stereographic triangle. Okay? And there are many other ways of uh, determining texture. Uh, so the, here, the advantage is that you know that the orientation of this particular grain is uh, a particular value. Yeah? Whereas when you do bulk X-ray texture measurements, of course, you have no details of the microstructure, and you can't tell where the intensity is actually coming from. So this has much more information than bulk texture, but bulk texture samples many, many more grains than you can do in EBSD experiments. OK, um, one uh, particular method of representing the orientation of a grain is known as the Euler angles. Okay? So uh, we, we will look at other methods of doing this, but Euler angles are quite popular. And they are, they are defined uh, as follows. So imagine that uh, x, small x, small y, and small z, the blue axes, are our reference axes. Okay? And we want to plot the coordinates of x, big y, and big z relative to the reference axes. Okay? Then we look at the z-axis here. And for the z-axis, we draw the plane which is at 90 degrees to that. And again, the plane at 90 degrees to that. And the intersection of that gives us this line n. Yeah? Is everybody happy with that? So we've got two sets of coordinates, small x and big, big x. The angle beta, one of the Euler angles, is simply the angle between the two z-axes. OK? Angle alpha is between our reference x and n, and gamma between the um, crystal x and n. OK? So these are called the three Euler angles. And basically, what it means is that you can rotate your crystal using three operations to bring it into coincidence with your reference coordinates. So I'm going to now represent this on a stereogram because it's easier to, uh, to visualize on a stereogram. So again, using the same colors on the stereogram as over here, uh, these are our reference axes, 100, 010, and 001. Okay? And this plane here is represented by this trace here. Okay? And in, in this case, I'm using the big X, big Y, and big Z as the rolling direction, transverse direction, and normal direction. So the normal direction is Z. And the angle between the normal direction and the Z axis of our reference is beta. Yeah, you can see that. Okay. And this, this angle between the reference X axis and the nodal line here is alpha. And the X axis of our sample and the nodal line is gamma. Okay? And what this means is that I can use three rotation operations to bring the two axes into coincidence. What it also means is that I need three parameters to specify the orientation of a crystal. Yeah? And these three parameters can be the three Euler angles, or it can be an axis of rotation and an angle of rotation. The axis of rotation has two independent components because it's a unit vector and the angle of rotation. So whatever method you choose, there are three numbers you need to specify the orientation of a crystal relative to some set of axes. Yeah, everyone happy with that? So let's stick with the Euler angles. Uh, when we look at a pole figure, something like this, it doesn't give us the complete information. Because there's one particular crystal which will have its 100 there, 010, and 001 there. Okay? And another crystal will have its 100 here, 010, and 1001. Uh, but I don't actually know that this comes from this crystal and this crystal. Yeah? These dots are all mixed up. I can't identify where the poles actually come from a particular crystal. 
Yeah? We've, we've, we've lost that information in the pole figure. So we need a, a better way of representing texture where we can say, OK, these particular dots come from a particular crystal. Yeah? Do you understand? In this pole figure, we've lost this information. We've simply plotted them all without identifying which dots come from which crystal, right? So if we have a better method of doing this, we should be able to say that this intensity comes from one crystal, this intensity comes from another crystal, and so on. So it would be nice to have just one dot representing the or full orientation of a single crystal, right? So supposing we look at the Euler angles, there are three angles. And we plot a cube in which the axes are the Euler angles, then a single dot within that cube will represent the orientation of that crystal, right? Yeah, so we take the three Euler angles and we plot a cube. So here is our cube. We have alpha, beta, and gamma. And we plot the orientation of a crystal as a single dot, because that single dot in the three-dimensional plot specifies all three Euler angles. Yeah? And then another dot is for another crystal. So if I wanted to work out the relationship between those two, then it's straightforward. Yeah, I have the alpha, beta, and gamma for this, and alpha, beta, and gamma for this. Is everyone happy with that? So this is called an orientation distribution function. People call it ODF, yeah? orientation distribution function, where a single dot represents one crystal. Okay? And we are plotting the Euler angles. Now, of course, when I start to plot thousands and thousands of points in there, because we are looking at bulk texture, uh, it's hard to visualize a 3D image of the ODF. So what we do is we take sections of this along particular planes, like this. OK, so this is a section along a particular value of one of the Euler angles. And basically, if I look at any particular point that will give me the orientation of the crystal relative to uh, your external axes, and these particular locations are showing me the orientation of the cube. Okay. And in practice, we need to look at many different sections to understand the, the texture. So you normally see the data presented like this, where these are slices along different values of one of the Euler angles. Okay. And how the intensity is distributed along here gives you information about the texture. And people, people actually give names to patterns like this. They might say, oh, there's a beta fiber running along here. So to discuss the texture, you would ident identify particular kinds of texture and say, look, the beta fiber is very strong over here, or the alpha fiber is strong. And you use your metallurgy to say, look, I want this alpha fiber to be strong if I want more formability, or if I want a particular R ratio, et cetera. Okay? So that's another subject, which is much better dealt with in uh, Professor Dong Lee's lectures, but the aim of today's lecture was to introduce you to pole figures and orientation distribution functions, and we have done that here. Yeah? So do you have any questions? Now, of course, the pole figure is a subset of the orientation distribution function. So once you have the orientation distribution function, it's easy to calculate a pole figure from that. So this is the most general way of representing texture. Now, for tomorrow's lecture, make sure that you printed out the copy of the book on geometry of crystals. OK? OK, 